Welcome home, Faith family. Well, that was not... Welcome home, Faith family. We're so glad that each and every one of you is here this morning to worship God and to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Pastor Mike and nine or ten others, I should know, um, are on their way to um, Hammond, Louisiana to do hurricane relief. So prayers as they travel down there and throughout the week that they will just be uh, able to use their hands and feet uh, to do good work in the name of God um, and while representing this congregation as well. Um, we're just so glad that each and every one of you is here this morning. have a couple of announcements. Um, the All Church Bible Study will continue this Tuesday. It'll be our second session on the Good Samaritan. 
Um, you can zoom in. I've sent out a link. If you need that, um, contact the church office and we'll make sure you have it. We will also be meeting in person here in the sanctuary, 6.30 p.m. Um, we had a few technical issues um, being able to hear on um, for those Zooming, and we think we have figured some of that out this week. So we hope you'll give us another try if last week it was a little bit difficult to hear um, or see the video. Um, we invite you already to prepare for Easter and share a joyful noise in our Easter cantata. Rehearsals are Wednesday evenings from 7.15 to 8.15. And all are welcome to join. You can talk to um, Doug, um, our music minister, um, or um, just show up on Wednesday night and they'll get you plugged in so that you can help make that a um, even more glorious day. Uh, we will be having a new members class and they will, it will be for three Sundays in a row starting on Sunday, March 20th. Um, if you can make one class or none of them, let Pastor Mike or I know if you are interested in the classes or becoming a member at St. Paul's. They will be between the two services, about 9.50 to 10.40-ish um, on those three days. Um, and finally, um, someone has let us know that there will be um, a musical production of Children of Eden at Arcadia Theater outside of Chicago. The, the, it is not until Saturday, September 17th at 2 p.m. We are hoping to plan a trip um, as a group. We will go down on Friday um, to Chicago on September 16th, um, eat dinner together, have a hotel, st um, the next day go to the matinee and then head home. $105 for the ticket to the play itself and th that'll be the deposit for the trip. And we will get the rest of the information out as soon as possible. We have to know to get group tickets, though, by February 13th. So it's a long way off. But we have to know within two weeks if people are interested um, so that we can get group tickets for that event. We will be sending out a constant contact this week. So if you are a longtime member here, if you are a first-time visitor, if you are an online follower, we are just so glad that you are worshiping with us today and hope that the Spirit fills you anew. Seasons come and days go by We are born and then we die Life's but a blink of an eye Here in this place Voices calling from the mist With temptations to resist But our life is more than this Here in this place For when all, when all Is said and done And our time has finally come What will we say? For what we have done While we're here in this place All men's glory light the fields And the beauty this earth yields For one day wither and be still here in this place Then our every little task Will be read from pages past And only what we've done for Christ will last Here in this place Oh, when all, when all is said done and our time has finally come what will we say 
for what we have done I will hear it Let us be in a time of prayer with one another and with our God. Father God, Jesus looked up to you and called you Dad. We understand through Jesus' relationship with you that you want us to love one another as families love one another. To know that you are protector and nurturer of us and our lives. The mother hen. The guiding father. So God, help us to recognize your love for us, to see ourselves as your children, to see ourselves as brothers and sisters, each to the other. All throughout the world, we have brothers and sisters that you have created, God. Help us to be that family to not always get along and sometimes even we might bicker, but to respect and love one another, understanding that we all come from and are loved by you. God, we're so thankful that you are a loving God. And we know that you know our hearts and minds, God, even better than we know them ourselves. So reside there, God, knowing our prayers, our worries, our sorrows, rejoicing with us in our joys. Help us, God, to be mindful of the teachings of your Son, that we might better know who you are and what you call us to do in our lives that our lights may shine, and that we might be a beacon in the darkness to those that are lost and need to be found. God, we're thankful for the gift of your Son, a sacrifice beyond our real comprehension. Mercy and grace, love poured out. Be with us, God, guide us. Share with us your love, hope, joy, and peace throughout the entire year. May your world be healed in its times of affliction and violence and hunger and loneliness, anger. God, be present. May your peace prevail. We reach out to you today through song and the words that your son taught us to help us pray to you.
Hear these words from the fourth chapter of Luke, verses 21 through 30. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in their hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian." All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I loved my childhood, and I loved to go back to where I came from, to the place that gave me roots, that in many ways made me who and what I am today. The hard thing about going back is that even though they helped to make me who and what I am today, they can't seem to ever really see me as who and what I am today. They always see me as that little girl that wore glasses with no lenses so she could intentionally rub her eye in the middle of a conversation with you. Or that middle school kid that wore socks pinned to herself because she was suffering from static cling. Yes, I did those things. I did lots of things like that. And I wonder why it is so hard for the people that knew me then to respect me for what it is that I do now. It is not unusual for me to get reacquainted with someone from my early years through Facebook or high school or college reunions and have them ask several times, you're a pastor. You're a pastor. Like a pastor of a church? Like a church that people actually attend? Today, Jesus experiences this. Jesus has just been tempted in the desert, resisted that temptation, and is full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has truly begun his ministry, and people are starting to hear about him, follow him, and be in awe of him. And then he goes home where he grew up, where they have helped to give him roots. And he does what he has always done. He goes to church and he reads the scripture. But this time Jesus adds a little bit more. Jesus lets his people know, those who know him best, that he is the fulfillment of that scripture. At first, they are excited, amazed at the gracious words that came from Jesus' lips. They have been waiting for this moment, the Son of God, to be known to them. But then they remember, hey, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's son? The scripture is a bit vague at this point. Do the hometown folks really begin to question and doubt Jesus Or does Jesus just assume they will because they have remembered that they know him? Because the next thing that Jesus utters is a reference to the proverb, physician, heal thyself. He knows that they are going to want proof, a big act of some kind, a sign. We want to understand, to believe, but we know you. You're Joseph's son. It is interesting 
how we put limits on people or have great expectations of people, sometimes just because of who their people are or how long we have known them. When I was in college, I was part of the program Best Buddies. The area group homes paired us up with persons with intellectual, intellectual disabilities, and we did things together monthly. And Wade was my buddy. He loved to come to all my intramural games, which made things easy, and he would run up and down the side of the court or field and cheer me on, no matter how I was doing. It rocked. Well, about mid-year, I learned that the founder of the organization, Anthony, was going to come to our chapter meeting. Everyone was really excited. I went to the meeting and felt like everyone was acting really weird. I felt like I was totally missing something. It was almost like Anthony could walk on water or something. We had a circle discussion, and I made a few observations about things I thought could be better. There was a gasp in the room, and I was really confused. But after the meeting, Anthony asked if he could follow up with me. We talked for another 30 or 45 minutes. He was a nice guy with a good heart. It wasn't until I read the campus paper the next day that I learned that Anthony's last name is Shriver, and he is indeed brother to Maria Shriver and son to Eunice Shriver, herself born a Kennedy. Now it all made sense. I think he loved the fact that I didn't know who he belonged to and could just judge him and his work on its merit alone. I must admit, though, I'm not sure I could have played it cool had I known from the beginning who his people are. Why is it that we often doubt our own people? Sometimes it is our own family, even our own offspring or our parents. More often it is someone that we have known secondhand through our communities our entire lives. They have watched us at school, seen us grow up at church, playing in our yards, shoveling their driveways, delivering your papers. We may not know them intimately, but we have known them and helped raise them in our own ways. Yet sometimes have a hard time believing that they might ever be more than just Joseph's son, they will always be the good kid that stays out of trouble, but... See, this is how the community of Jesus is seeing him. It is then that Jesus sets all those that have helped to raise him, his home community, on edge. He basically refuses to heal thyself, to give them proof, and even cites scripture around Elijah and Elisha, and how they had to go far away for those around them to recognize their gifts and accept them as they are and not try to see them as they were. They may have even had to go outside of the holiest of places to be accepted and not questioned and tested. How far do you have to travel from home before you begin to feel that you can accomplish all that you know you can? How far do you have to travel before someone recognizes the wings that you have sprouted and quits trying to judge you solely on the roots that they helped you form? See, we plant seeds, and we water the plant, and we pray for good roots, and then have a hard time beholding or believing it when beautiful fruit blossoms. Even though that is what we have prayed for, throughout our lives. Jesus' hometown folks are so incensed by his refusal to prove to them his status, or they're jealous, or they're beginning to doubt what he has claimed, or there are probably a lot of emotions floating around out here. They are so furious, though, that they march Jesus to the top of a hill in order to throw him off the cliff. This does seem a bit extreme to me, but Jesus is also making extreme claims. 
Sometimes it is hard enough to believe that little Tommy that always pulled all the girls' pigtails is now an advocate for women's rights. Imagine how far of a leap it might have been to see the carpenter's son, a good family, always active in church, but now thinks he is the son of God? And almost convinced me as well. He seems so genuine. His words so gracious, but now he won't prove it to us, says he must distance himself from us. It is said that those that know and love us the best can also hurt us the most. Truer words have never been spoken. What happens when we don't feel like our own family supports us, believe in us, and can see our wings? What happens when those who have helped shape us and watered the seed they have planted want to cut us back to our roots? When I worked at the children's home 25 years ago, that was the saddest thing to me. I heard story after story about the ones that were supposed to love me most and protect me as the ones that never defended me. They lent me out to friends, literally, and encourage me to get drunk at an early age because it was cute. Imagine how difficult it would be to spread your wings if you never even grew roots. Luckily, this type of rejection is really rare, albeit too often at the same time. Don't we love those that know us the best because they know us the best, but also fear their rejection the most? Don't we often feel some kind of rejection from those that know us the best because they have seen our faults, our idiosyncrasies, our stumbling blocks, and have a hard time believing that we really can do amazing things? I can't tell you how many times a proud parent will declare the amazing things their children are doing, even their adult children, but also tell me how hard it is to believe that they are. There is a second side to this story and how the community responds. They believe in what they have heard about Jesus, but they also want a piece of it. They are excited that he has come home and hope that he will help all of them, their synagogue, to make it on the map. Wonders will be told about Jesus coming home and all the things he did there. But Jesus doesn't play that game. Jesus isn't who he is for notoriety or fame, but to change the world. Jesus doesn't want Nazareth to be on the map because he is from there. He wants them to be on the map because they believe. So Jesus ends up on a high hill, surrounded by those that know him best, that have raised him, that are furious because he will not perform a sign, And Jesus asserts that you can never really be accepted in your hometown. And he walks right through the crowd and goes on his way. Thanks be to God. Amen.
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, lending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. When those that we have helped to plant and nurture and grow roots come and visit us, let us be able to see their wings and rejoice fully in all that they have been able to do. May God bless and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and bring you peace until we meet again, my friends. And the mission of St. Paul's is to be a place of worship, refuge, and outreach. Go in peace. Amen.